This is the Stop Time Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hopkins, and I'm here to engage you in thought-provoking motivational conversations around practicing the art of living in the moment. I'm a certified life coach, and I'm excited to dig deep and offer insights into embracing who we are and where we are at. My next guest is no stranger to the Broadway stage. As a dancer, she has appeared in Broadway in 14 shows, including Fosse, Movin' Out, A Chorus Line, Spamalot, and Swing. She choreographed Broadway in London's Waitress and La Traviata at the Met Opera. She is currently choreographing Broadway's Mrs. Doubtfire, Almost Famous, The Public's The Visitor, and Broadway-bound The Outsiders and Like Water for Chocolate. She is a drama desk, Lortel and Cheetah Rivera nominee and has traveled to India and Africa multiple times to work with the Gates Foundation in family health and planning. I caught up with her after a rehearsal for Waitress, which is getting ready to reopen after being dark for almost 18 months. It's one of the first shows to be back on Broadway and starts in previews on September 2nd. I think you're going to love this conversation with Lauren Lotaro. Lauren, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I know you're just rushing in. And when I invited you to join me, you shared with me what your schedule was, right? And so you said, oh, yeah, I, uh, I have rehearsals 10 to 6, uh, Monday through Saturday, and, um, you know, I'm going into tech. But the fact that you, you know, were still willing, I was ready for the next line to be, so thanks, but I have no time. But it was like, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, like, literally, and not only yeah, but like, and willing, to find the time. So that says a lot about you. It really, really does. And it made me even more excited to get to know you a little bit. So first question, really, I'm curious, like, what was it? We don't know each other. You're a very busy lady. What was it about me asking you that made you decide? Yeah. I just think it's an interesting time. And I think people need connections, including me. So talking to somebody seemed like a fun idea. I mean, it's been an isolated year and a half and yeah. not much talk about my art and our, our art and our industry and our community. So I thought it would be fun to just, you know, get into it and have a conversation. So the saying yes thing kind of stood out to me. And so I just want to dig in there a little bit, because I mean, if you look at what you've done, it doesn't look like you've said a whole lot of no's. <laughs> no, I generally in my life say yes, you know, um, I probably could learn how to say no a little more often, but I don't really, I'm, I don't know. I have a lot of energy and I'm not a big sleeper and I'm not an introvert. So I don't know, unless it doesn't seem like a good idea, I, I generally am willing to try something. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Like, it doesn't sound to me like that was a message that was sent to you. Like it is so many of us in the performing arts, like just say yes, just say yes. You have to say yes. So a lot of, a lot of people I speak with and that I've worked with have said yes, because they felt like they should. They had a limiting belief of should, and it became this fear-based yes. Yeah, that's not me. I think no. that, first of all, I have seen the, oh, this sounds so corny, but I've seen the power of yes. In other words, I just always was enthusiastic, maybe sometimes overly enthusiastic. If I had, if I had to lean one way, I'm probably the person that's a little too enthusiastic about things. <laughs> But it always, it always worked for me. In other words, when I said yes and offered myself to something, it didn't always pan out, but I generally learned something from it. Even if what I learned is I don't want to be in that room anymore, or I don't want to give that much of myself to somebody anymore. I've always sort of, for better or for worse, need or use the experience to then make those decisions. But, but I would say overall, the being in a room and saying yes to something, an experience of any sort has been overwhelmingly positive versus negative for me. Yeah. And you don't strike me as someone, another thing that stood out, and again, I don't know you, but one of my favorite things to do when I don't know the guest is to really kind of to research them and to look in. And when I'm researching, I'm not looking at your choreography. I'm looking at maybe things you said or snippets of something, you know, like I like to hear. And, and it strikes me that that's kind of your superpower. I mean, some people, again, say yes, and just trust the process and jump in, which I'm hearing a little bit of that. But with you, I feel like you have a superpower of confidence and that it's backed up with everything's going to just happen the way it's going to happen. But, but 
you always show up as prepared as you can and, and that you're aligned in, with yourself. That's what, I, that's what I get from you. Yeah, I think for sure. I think that's how I've survived in this industry is that I've tried to make the industry work for me. And what is aligned about that is that I love what I do. So it's not that hard to make it work for me because in general experiences creatively make me happy. But when I'm not happy, I also very easily leave that space. Fair enough. And yeah. so when, when you're not happy um, and you're aware that you're not happy in a situation, what do you do? I mean, I, I, I change jobs <laughs> or I speak up, you know? Yeah. I love that. I love that. So, so if I'm hearing you correctly, you, you leap into not just anything, but you leap into something that you feel obviously aligned with, you know, you yeah. do your due, due diligence and that you feel you can offer to, and also that it can offer you something. Cause it sounds like growth is huge, right? You're not just going to take every single show for a gig, right? I'm always interested in learning learning, learning. Oh, the eternal student is my motto. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the mastery mindset, isn't it? It's really the infinite mind. I mean, it's that sort of, you know, not just going from goal to goal and getting to the goal and not finding what you thought you'd feel when you got there, but rather going in, knowing what, what your values are, what, what you're standing in, and then not taking it personally when things don't work because it's not you. Right. So has there been a time like when maybe you wished you had said no or when it would, <laughs> <laughs> or when it would have served you? Maybe? I mean, when I'm working 8 a.m. to midnight for five weeks in a row and I'm like, who mm. thought this was a good idea? I mean, yes, but the great thing about this industry is that every job has an opening night and like there's just this thing that you're headed towards and then it's done. Yeah. <laughs> Creatively in, in the way that you are asked to be present anyway. Yeah. So it's all right. So even if I'm over overextended or doing something I'm not happy with, there's an, there's an end date. So let's just do what we can. And then, and then you get to sort of start over, you know, doing shows affords a person infinite beginnings. Absolutely. That's you a beautiful know. way to look at it. Um, and it's, it's somewhat like, I mean, you're a mom, so it's not unlike giving birth is it each time. It's the same. And it's also just like being with a child every day. It's like every day is different and some days stink, some minutes stink. Yeah. It's, or like sometimes I can be with my daughter for like in a 10 minute span. Like, you know, one minute is amazing. The next minute is horrible. The next minute is sort of okay. The next minute food's all over the place. Like so many things happen. So it's just like, you know, just riding the wave. <laughs> well, and she's three, right? You said. And she's three. Yeah, she's yeah. three and a half. Yeah, no, it's all, the business is a lot like this. Like she hurt herself the other day and she was, you know, crying. I was like, you know, pain is, you know, think about what it feels like. I know it hurts, but it's just a feeling. It'll go away. It's just one feeling. It's not like the end of the world. That's you know? right. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional, right? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about grit? You know, I've been reading a lot about grit. I don't know if you're into that sort of kind of reading, but and the idea that, you know, this whole myth that, you know, you got to have the grit and you got to do this, you know, I'm, I'm picturing now Debbie Allen, as I said that, you know, <laughs> well, fame costs, you know, that, you know, that sort of, yeah. Big conversation these days. And I think it's different for everybody. And I was talking to my friend who was a dancer for many years and went back to school for psychology. And, you know, you, everybody has a different relationship to to pain, to joy, to trauma, to, you know, old wounds, to new wounds. So it's different. And it's just managing, I think, these feel, you know, all of it. And I think that I had a young actress today in rehearsal. It's her first Broadway show. She was non-equity a week ago. And she just got waitress. And this is her first equity job and first job on Broadway. And ironically, I gave her her first job eight years ago in non-equity at Barrington Stage doing Kiss Me Kate. So she knew me eight years ago. So she came up to me during lunch break today and she said, what, you know, you've been in this business a long time. She said something nice about me. And then she said, what, what, tell me, what do you think it is about this business? What, what are the pitfalls and what should I do? And I just said, you know, you have to take care of yourself and you have to check in with yourself 
every couple of months and just make sure that you're still aligned with your desires and you can't let this business take over you. You have to make it work for your life. You have to have a full life and this business has to be a part of that life. And then at certain points in your life, the business can be your whole life. But wouldn't it be sad if the business was your whole life, your whole life? <laughs> you know, and I said this, it's like, there is a time, right? It's like Ecclesiastes. There is a time and that time can fluctuate just like a three-year-old's time fluctuates within 10, 10 minutes of joy and pain and scared and all those things. So it's like just being present. Otherwise, I think that too much grit and not enough consciousness just, you know, boy, that carrot is always inches away from your fingertips. So if you chase the carrot your whole life, whew, what kind of life is that? But if you, you know, Make sure the carrot is in your eyesight and still do other things and every once in a while turn your back on the carrot. I think that I think there's something there. I mean, there's a difference between performing through um, you know, a little pain and performing on a broken leg, but pain feels different for everybody. And that can go for emotional or physical. So it's very, you know, it's like we're just beginning this conscious kind of conversation about things. Yes, indeed. It sounds like that's, that's a philosophy that you've had. I mean, it feels like you've had it forever. It doesn't feel like you had an epiphany one day. No, that it might've been like, you know, I don't know, immigrant parents, but I, I, I walked into this, I walked into this business wanting it badly. And at the same time, wanting a full life, mm. you know, making yeah. sure that you know, I mean, even the act of having a child in this industry, it took immense courage and I hid it from everybody until I was, I was eight months pregnant and a producer was like, um, are, are you pregnant? <laughs> yeah. And some of that has to do with just being an industry that is freelance, essentially. You don't, there's no, you know, there's no maternity leave. There's no, like, I've been to this company for 20 years. It just doesn't exist. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. I'm curious though, um, you, I know your parents were not in the arts and that you just somehow were born with wanting to dance, right? I learned that about you. Totally. Like first grade, I was like, I'm going to be a dancer. And I'm not, I'm still not sure, like maybe all little girls used to say that. And I just never outgrew it. <laughs> no, I don't know. I remember being in like sixth grade, we went to see the Nutcracker and I pointed at Juilliard and I was like what is that building mm -hmm. and some like that's like fame but for college like you go there if you want to dance or sing or act and I was like that's where I'm gonna go wow. <laughs> I just decided <laughs> that's so interesting so what's your Achilles heel I mean you obviously are a very strong talented creative person but what's your Achilles heel I mean I probably will die of like um you know <laughs> like Alzheimer's because I get no sleep. So <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I have tons of Achilles heels, you know, I mean, tons. You want to share one? <laughs> sure. I mean, um, I mean, sometimes they care too much mm. about things that I don't need to care about. And um, I want to be successful to the point that I think um, I want to be liked. I think that's a biggie, actually. I want to be liked. Mm. So sometimes, you know, you have to decide about telling the truth, you know, or being liked. I think that's always, I think that, you know, definitely that's a thing, right? It's like, do I want to be likable in this moment or do I want to tell my truth in this moment? Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's a biggie. Um, getting older, it's interesting to sort of see in things shift and what that feels like and sit with the uncomfortableness of some of that and you know are there sort of um limiting beliefs that served you once that don't serve you anymore when you revisit them do you know what i mean like they're probably things as you were coming up in your career or growing up like what has shifted for you as you've sort of become more and more ensconced in your work and your life um i mean for me it's really about making choices that are not just about my well-being, but about my family's well-being. Mm. So it's a big shift. And sometimes it's a struggle because again, being so, you know, ingrained in a certain way of thinking. I mean, that's the biggie for me is just like changing my, you know, desires to fit the needs of my husband and my child and not just what I selfishly want and need is sort of the big, big shift in my life. 
Mm. And that means saying no to a show that I've always wanted to do. You know, that might mean, no, I can't go out of town for eight weeks this summer with this show. It just doesn't work for my family. How would you say any limiting beliefs about what women can and cannot do factored into your choices along the way? I was always a little bit cantankerous in this, in the way that, you know, women should either have a child or work. It's unfair to a child to be a working mom. And I was like, yeah, even in like second grade, I was like, no way. I mean, you know, I was always sort of a bit of a rebel. So I would say that the limiting stuff was never something I was interested in. If something was taboo, I mean, you know, I went to Egypt by myself in college and it was like, if it was not supposed to happen, I was doing it. It would be the other direction of like, mm. how much is too much is really the stuff that I'm still working on. You know, that's, yeah. that would, that's the step where my work is and, and currently is like I said it's not it doesn't mean that it's easy to say no to a job that I want that to go out of town eight weeks but my family you know needs me that's not easy for me yet <laughs> no and it's interesting because and I hear this a lot with the people I work with um it's interesting sometimes too because it can shift into the I get to say no not I have to say no do you know I me? Mean? Right. Like it's a transition, isn't it? To sort of go, well, what do you mean? I have to make a decision like this. I want both, right? And you strike me as someone say it can be done. Right. Um, but to connect it, like not only just in your action, but in your intention, let's say, where it is really connected to your value of home. And it doesn't mean you can't have the other, but maybe just not in this way or redefining right. it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Super cool. I love that. It'll be interesting to see. Um, you're going to raise a very fierce daughter, no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. So, so much obviously has shifted, right, in our world and in our industry, especially um, over the past, what, 16 months. And what discoveries have you made sort of about yourself along the way that you might not have otherwise discovered? All kinds of things. I don't know. I'm, I'm more of a homebody than I thought. And, you know, once the initial, honestly, it's like we all had, um, what do psychologists call it? Like a adjustment disorder. Like the whole world suffered from adjustment disorder and we're all still, I'm dealing with it now being back at work. Everybody sort of spontaneously bursts out in tears every once in a while. And they're like, I'm not even sure why I'm crying. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's just like, you know, to just turn the faucet back on is very, very difficult. Turning the faucet off was very difficult for me, but then it was comfortable. And, you know, I just sort of, figured out how to be a mom. And that was a big deal for me because I went back to work two and a half weeks after I gave birth. Mm. So um, I literally was holding my daughter like, why well, I got to do this all day long. You know, this was like, you know, cause we kept our nanny who we love very much. We kept her on salary. It was the right thing to do, but we kept her home because it was the right thing to do. She's back with us now that I'm back mm. at work, but I was like full-time mommying and I'd never done that. So that was scary. And I had to come face to face with things that I wasn't good at and um, learn how to have patience with this little child, which was a really big um, thing for me. But I learned that I like being home and that I learned that as an artist, here's what I, here's, a, like, here's something huge that I think everybody probably feels, but maybe hasn't put into words. I am an artist because I'm an artist. I am not an artist because I'm working in the industry. What I learned is that I bring my artistry to my daily life. I, I make my bed like an artist. I cook like an artist. I think like an artist. I pick what books I read as an artist. I watch TV and documentaries as an artist. It's, I am. It's not because I'm getting paid to be. And that, sadly, was kind of revelatory for me because it was all tied up for me in like succeeding as an artist, you know, you gotta be a good artist, but that, what does that mean? You know? Yeah. Oh yeah. 100. Yeah. You nailed it. I mean, 100%. What do you think will be different for you with that knowledge to moving forward into, into continuing on? I'm really the consciousness about it all. I'm really taking this time to really try and hold on to this sense of self that is that loves this being creative but that is not defined by it and that doesn't mean I'll do less or more work it just means I'll approach the work in a in maybe in a deeper way right because it's not about success it's really about making sure every minute I'm I'm I want to be where I want to be you know yeah, yeah. 
Well, it's really, it really comes down to the essence of who we are, right? So the, the, um, the art that the, the way we do our art as artists is just a vehicle for the, for coming out of us. Right. You know, if someone said to you, Lauren, I'm afraid you can't choreograph or dance anymore because that's not allowed in the world anymore, that you would be fine. I'd be fine. <laughs> I mean, I think I'd miss it. Of but course, I, of course. I, I, I would be fine two years ago. If you said that to me, I don't know if I would be fine, but I, I would be fine now in the sense that I've discovered that my creativity, I think would move into other things. Yeah, 100%. Do you, do you remember, um, you probably do, like where you were on March 12th or whenever, or maybe maybe when you heard about it, yeah. Yeah, we had just had um, two previews for Mrs. Doubtfire. My husband is a, a surgeon, he's a physician. So he's at Mount Sinai. So, you know, we were all week, he, he was like, oh, it's not gonna shut down. Oh, it might shut down. This would be unprecedented. I can't imagine. And then like, the day it all happened, he was like, he called me, he's like, something big is about to happen. I think that the hospitals are getting to a point where they're overwhelmed and I think they might do something about it. And then by four o'clock we were in rehearsal and our producer came and it was their opening night for another show, which was so sad. So he was all dressed up, ready for their opening night of six. We were at Mrs. Doubtfire and he just said, Cuomo's closing the city for four weeks. <laughs> We'll see you in four weeks. Go home, rest, be safe, wash your hands. <laughs> and then we went to his office, the creative team, and sat there and made the list of the what we're going to do four weeks from now. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, again, it's like talk about adjustment disorder. I'm sitting there going like, well, I can get some dancers in a room tomorrow. They'll come. They'll come work with me. You know, because you just, you don't know. And everyone was like, yeah, great. Let's do that. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's like, you just not thinking, right? I left my sneakers on the table and my pencil and notes on the table. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll see them again, like in the middle of October, when we go back into rehearsals for Mrs. Doubtfire, but they've been just sitting there like a ghost town in the theater. It's insane. Yeah. You know, four weeks became a month, a month became two months, two months became four months, you know? Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, so much wrong. You know, I mean, I thought that last September, everything was going to open back up a year ago, you know, <laughs> that's just so, so crazy. Ah, so like everybody, it's so funny. It's like, I'll get on a call with, you know, somebody younger, somebody my age, somebody very older than me. It's like, and everybody feels like they're the worst age for this to have happened. Like, you know, I, Selfishly, of course, was like, this was the worst age. Like, I was about to have three Broadway shows. I've been working my whole career for this moment. This was the season. And then just it. And now everything's changed. And it's just over. It's over. It's terrible for me. And then, like, you talk to these young kids who were like, I was about to have my freshman year of college. And the whole thing, I, I missed a whole year of a college experience. Or, you know, or Annalise, like, I was just starting my professional career in this huge way and it just I lost a whole two years of my professional career or you talk to you know I you know I, directors who are older and you know in their 80s who are ready to retire and they're like I have like one or two shows left before I die this is the worst thing that could have ever happened so it just it just hits everybody it just hit everybody no matter what it, I guess the lesson is like it just hit everybody terribly, no matter what age it is. Nine-year-olds missing school and homeschooling and not yeah. getting socialized, all of it. Yeah. You know? 100%. What's your definition of living in the moment? I'm terrible at living in the moment. I, But I really, I really am. I, I, for me, I'm the most living in the moment when I'm actually in the middle of creation. Maybe that's why I find it so satisfying is that all the noise is gone. But other than that, I'm a big planner. So if I have free time, I'm planning it vacation I'm deciding where we're going to go for dinner <laughs> so I'm not great at it but living in the moment for me when I am in a room inside a story that I have to create characters around and a story around I'm really in in that moment trying to make something happen and I love that I find it very satisfying and and peaceful <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so you've definitely felt your definition of it. And it's funny because um, your first response I just noted was like, I'm not very good at it. 
And that right there, it's interesting, is a limiting belief that A, you should be good at it. It must be good for me. I don't do it. I should do it more. And it's amazing in this world of wellness that we all think that. And then you went on to say, actually, <laughs> I'm in the moment quite a lot in my work. So my work. Yeah. That's and pretty my baby. I will say that, like, oh my gosh. I, I, for me, motherhood has been. I, I, mo mostly glorious I mean like so when I'm like with her looking at her reading her a book in the middle of the night you know when she wakes up and wants me to come into her bedroom I am truly in the moment I mean in fact I am actually I actually there are moments where I'm like just smelling her and just saying like just remember this feeling because you'll you know so those moments I'm actually super in the moment you know super oh, yeah it's so yeah. visceral. I wish people could see you because it's like you're almost, you're bubbling and oozing with it. It's so visceral. You know what I find really interesting as an artist? Before I was a mom, you'd watch all these movies or whatever it is about being a mom. And, and, and I, here's how I really feel. I have never seen a play, a movie, a musical, a radio play. I've actually never seen this feeling truly captured. I've never seen it. It's so weird. I've seen it almost captured. I've seen like where you try and sort of pull, like try and, you know, it's called like a simulacra, like you simulate the feeling or you try and manipulate the feeling or even like, you know, even the most sort of heart wrenching of shows like Lorenzo's Oil or, you know, I don't know, or, um, you know, like Schindler's List or something. Sophie's it, Choice, yeah. Sophie's Choice. It still doesn't capture for me anyway, what I've, the gift of like feeling what it is to be a mom, for me, this was just a huge, huge gift. I, I just find that interesting that art for me hasn't, didn't quite capture it. That's really interesting. Cause as a mother, I completely agree with you. As a mother and an artist, you never could have told me or you could have told me, I wouldn't have believed you that being a mother is like the most incredible thing. No right. one can tell you that, right? No, and I, I've never really seen it done well. But maybe everybody doesn't feel that way. No, I don't know that they do. M Mommy's working, sweetie. As if on cue, Lauren's beautiful little girl, Arden, came in and said hello to us. What do you know will be true about you no matter what happens? I'll be okay. I mean... I'll be all right. I love, I don't know. I love experiences. So, you know, I, I'll, I, and I like living and I just think I'll, I'll find something that brings me joy. I think yeah. for the most part, I mean, there are certain things that, you know, scare the hell out of me that I couldn't even say out loud, but other than those things that really, yeah. you know, I think that ultimately money, where I live, my business, people deciding they hate me on Twitter. I think ultimately I'd, I'd be okay, you know? No, absolutely. And how, how do you want to be remembered? I don't know. I mean, I hope that the people I work with get something, you know, that they feel is valuable. But for me at this point, my legacy is really going to be about my family. You know, a Tony Award, no Tony Award. You know, that used to be a big thing for me. I think that the legacy thing has changed about what I want my legacy to be about. I want, I want my grandkids, hopefully, to, you know, tell stories about me. I mean, that's really what has shifted for me big time. Mm. And what kind of stories do you want them to tell? I don't know, funny stories or stories about uh, courage or kindness or um little lessons I don't know fond memories yeah that's beautiful um okay can you finish this phrase most people think Lauren Lataro dot 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 but the truth is uh depends on who knows me from where but most people think Lauren Lataro is super competitive <laughs> Um, you know, from dancer days, but the truth is I, I could create stories for no money with a group of kids on an Island 
and have another 10 children of my own and be pretty happy. <laughs> That's um, all right, just before I let you go, I'm going to say the word, you let me know what it conjures and, and that's it. All right. So what makes you hungry? Chocolate. Sad. Loneliness. Inspired. Reading. Mm. Frustrated. Making choices. Mm. Why is that? Just, just having to, having to make one or the other choice. It's just growing up knowing you can't just do everything all the time. <laughs> You can't be in five places at the same time. You have to choose one place. Yeah, makes sense. Um, what makes you laugh? My husband or my daughter. What makes you angry? Um, injustice and hypocrisy. Mm. And what makes you feel grateful? My parents. Very cool. What are the top three things that happened so far today? Um, a really fun morning with my daughter. A very meaningful and um really sharp run through of waitress and um a, a meeting about waitress with a glass of wine over the with the creative team that I love very much oh that's great and Sarah's going back in right she's in she's gonna be amazing yeah she's incredible and talk about a kind person she is really it's uh, your energy is beautiful Thanks. No, absolutely beautiful. I mean, you just, you radiate. I mean, this is on a friggin' like two dimensional thing. Um, so I, I just want to thank you um, for showing up and I'm not surprised, you know, I'm not surprised that you showed up in the way you did. Um, and I'm going to let you go, but I, I so appreciate you. And thank you. Thank you so much. Best of luck with everything. Please yeah. stay in touch. Go read to that little girl. I will. Bye. Okay. Bye. I've been speaking today with Lauren Lataro. I'm Lisa Hopkins. Stay safe and healthy, everyone, and remember to live in the moment. In music, stop time is that beautiful moment where the band is suspended in rhythmic unison, supporting the soloist to express their individuality. In the moment, I encourage you to take that time and create your own rhythm. Until next time, I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks for listening.